So welcome everyone, my name is Michał Kubiak. Uh, today with me is Luis Mota. We are very happy to welcome you to the panel entitled Researching Priorities at the Local Level. What, why, how. Today we want to share our thoughts, our opinions on the subject, which we formed across, um, well, the time we've been involved with these subjects, also across our discussions we've had prior to the um, conference. So to me, the subject is of uh, great importance because I am the research coordinator for the Polish Foundation for the Effective Altruism. So um, this local level research comes with that job description. And uh, Luis, could you share how is it with you? What's your background and what got you interested in the local level research? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Luis. Uh, I'm currently a pre-doctoral researcher in economics at the Global Priorities Institute. And there my research is like quite academically focused on like trying to uh, understand like foundational questions related to doing good. Um, but yeah, throughout my work there, I've also like been exploring and thinking about like how to prioritize well in EA and so on. Um, I am from Brazil and during my undergraduate degree, which I was doing before I joined GPI, I did some community building there and um, Brazil is in a very different situation than like rich countries like the US, UK, where EA was developed. Uh, and when I was there, uh, there were like lots of people, um, lots of people questioned how we should like think about um, doing good in, in this context, which is different uh, from where EA originated. Um, in particular, like Brazil is like much poorer. And so like what, what changes does this bring to the way um, we should go about um, doing good? Uh, and when I started talking to community builders in odd, other uh, lower middle income countries, I realized that this is a recurring point. So it's something that uh, happens in lots of different places. Uh, and so I decided to think and uh, write a bit about it. And uh, yeah, I hope to share some of my thoughts today with you. Mm -hmm. I have to give a thumbs up on what you've just said, because I also have uh, a community building uh, experience by starting a local group, by being involved with some messaging we did as the Polish Foundation for Effective Altruism in some content creation, messaging to the press, and I can attest to that, that these sort of local questions also do come up very often, the questions on how Poland is different in terms of fundraising opportunities, in terms of impactful opportunities, and so on. But, um, well, maybe not let us get ahead of our, ourselves. Um, I will uh, just let you uh, very quickly know what we will be discussing today. So we will start with some um, framework on how to look at the local pro context research. Um, then we'll go over how different, um, different are the opportunities within the local context research. What's their direct and indirect impact? What risks are associated with going that way? And in the end, we'll discuss some case studies we found interesting in the subject area. And finally, uh, we'll close with some takeaways. So, uh, Luis, you have, um, a number of months ago, contributed a piece to EA Forum discussing uh, your framing for the local um, context research. So uh, could you elaborate on that? How do you see the subject? Sure. So um, <coughs> the question that I want to pose is here is like, what goals should uh, a local level EA group have? Uh, so if we think of EA as um, thinking about how to try to do the most good for the world, like for everyone, then the question is how do you adapt this to like local countries? How do you implement this goal in like uh, specific regions? And then there are like two ways that seem to come like kind of naturally for, for how to go about doing this adaptation. The first is what I'll call like here the like region centric adap adaptation. So trying to think about how to do what's best for a given region. Um, another way to think about it is a way that uh, adopts a more impartial um, notion of doing good. And it's thinking about how to do what's best for the world, uh, for everyone. Uh, given the circumstances that are uh, faced by like EA groups uh, within that specific region. Um, and the adaptation that st strikes me as like being the most, like the one that is in line with the principles like underlying EA is the second one in particular because it sticks to this impartiality principle. So uh, we're still like not differentiating people based on like where they come from 
Um, but yeah, we're trying to help everyone. Um, and in some contexts, and I think like this is where like uh, the, the discussion here today will center, in some contexts, uh, it might be the case that these two coincide. So we're, in, we're interested in exploring the possibility that trying to do, uh, trying to find what are the best things, uh, that, the things that help a given region the most, uh, also coincide with like doing the things that will help the world the most. Um, yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm. this was one, one this comment was on this one is one very powerful phrase I found when doing the reading while we prepared mm -hmm. is that when pursuing local opportunities, the idea is to leverage the local opportunities, not to narrow down your moral mm -hmm. circle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think yeah. this is a very mm -hmm. powerful um, thing to remember. Yeah, I um, agree. Mm -hmm. So what about the direct impact of mm -hmm. local interventions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first, I guess, like the most uh, <coughs> natural first consideration here is to try to think about like how big is the difference uh, in impact between like local level interventions and global interventions. Um, and so like as an exercise to, to illustrate this point, let's think about um, global like development um, and let's use Central Eastern European countries as an example here. Uh, if you look at the distri distribution of income levels in 2021, uh, for the uh, 20 countries that, like roughly 20 countries that are classified as belonging to this geographical region, uh, we see that 10 countries are classified as having high income, um, nine countries are classified as being upper middle income countries, uh, and only one of these is classified as a lower middle income country, uh, which was Ukraine in 2021, uh, and there are no low income countries uh, in the region. Uh, as an as specific as example, uh, Poland is classified as, be as being a high income country. Uh, its income uh, per capita is twice as large as that of Brazil, which is where I'm from, and it's a higher, um, high, um, uh, an upper middle income country. Um, Poland is eight times richer per capita than Nigeria or India. Uh, both of which are lower middle income countries. Uh, and yeah, Nigeria has like, I think Give Directly uh, operates in Nigeria and maybe one other uh, Give All Recommended Charity. Um, yeah, and so like you get that this gap in income between these countries like can be quite large. So it doesn't mean that the difference between Poland and say the UK or the US isn't large, it still is. So for example, the gap between UK and Poland is uh, three times, like the UK is three times richer uh, per capita as Poland and the US is four times richer per capita than Poland. So the gap is still big, uh, but I think it's like relatively easy for us to see the difference between like the countries like that we're from, if we're not from uh, the, these very rich countries and the countries higher up, but it's harder for us to gauge the difference between where we are and the countries that are like at lower income brackets. Uh, and you can have like, yeah, basically these uh, pretty big gaps that mm -hmm. suggest that there are better, like there might be interventions that are much better in these other countries. Mm -hmm. If I may interject with a comment, you've mentioned that the differences are like uh, within the scope of three times, four times, eight times. Uh, from my experience, I've also found that this is just a proxy because the actual either fundraising opportunities or impact opportunities, the differences much be, can be much wider than that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, for example, one figure I often cite is that I found a piece of research claiming that in Poland the rate of charitable giving is at 4% of the US. Uh, so this suggests more of a 25 times of, uh, of a spread, uh, which is much more than uh, the GDP per capita difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so it's also the case that um, like the, the exercise that I just did is like a very rough first approximation. And I guess it's something that is kind of like trying to like doing this in the very initial step of like trying to uh, identify what the priorities are at the local level. Uh, but there can be exceptions. And in particular, very recently, like uh, an EA organization in Israel identified that iodine deficiency uh, is a like big problem there. 
uh, to the point that intervening in doing that is something that they're like still, as far as I'm aware, they're still like trying to explore and see like how viable it is, but it could be uh, like the effectiveness of such intervention could be comparable to those of uh, Give All Top Charities. Uh, and Israel is a, a rich country. It's like its income per capita is roughly the same as the UK. Uh, and so, yeah, you can still like the income as a proxy as I used is like a very rough thing. And it doesn't mean that there won't be opportunities, but I guess it, it gives us some indication. Uh, and I guess like the question of like whether you can find good opportunities or not and under which contexts is like kind of still open, but we have to take these mm -hmm. factors into consideration. We've discussed some uh, context, some ideas, uh, rules of thumb, where to look for such uh, low hanging fruit possibly mm -hmm. along the lines of um, maybe differing across regions within certain countries. Some countries are rather large and their regions are as big as some other countries. So this could be a step to go. Mm -hmm. Also looking at the marginalized groups, uncommon cause areas, also, there is an important question of what metrics do we actually take for impact? Do we, mm, for example, uh, focus on well-being because this is an ongoing discussion within EA? Mm -hmm. There may be different results depending on uh, how do you frame that question. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so maybe let's skip to the next, well, not skip, go, to the next chapter of indirect benefits of local interventions because we've also identified several of these, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, Two of my favorites is how the indirect benefit of local interventions, local research can be tied to community building, as I mentioned in the, in the very beginning. Uh, we've had discussions with either um, community builders and other members of the EA community here in Central and Eastern Europe, and we discussed to a great length that our region differs very much from the Western world. So probably you need to frame the message of EA somewhat differently, depending on the culture, on the history, um, and having answers to these questions on how is it different for us um, than the Western world in terms of effectiveness. This is very, uh, I think, uh, powerful. And I think the same is roughly true for uh, Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, also, in terms of community building, it makes um, for a very powerful tool, I think, for involving people in making local groups more independent. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to come at the cost of uh, global interventions, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so one, one way to like, think about this is like this framing of like, you either do one, you either um, tell a person donate um, internationally or like contribute, like dedicate your career to the international cause or tell them to contribute to the local cause. Uh, but these don't necessarily have to come at the cost uh, of each other in particular. So if the, suppose that the EA community in a country is already like developed enough that like they're able to like uh, reach out to people and try to identify people who would be quite inclined to uh, work on the global problem and would be like in a like well positioned to like have a good chance at doing so. Um, there are still people who primarily care about their region and are not like willing to like compromise on that but who would be willing to try to um, work on the most effective uh, opportunities to help their region. Uh, and my impression is that uh, it makes sense to try to reach out to these people, so get these people um, to like involved in trying to yeah do more good uh, at some stage. Uh, but I think the, the, the catch here is that we're trying to uh, do that at a stage where um, the global opportunities are mostly taken care of so that we can like encompass these people like in addition to people who are uh, mostly driven by this like wanting to help the world as much as possible um, kind of goal. Another uh, argument that I, another indirect benefit of this type of intervention that I think is um, a pretty important one and maybe like one of the perhaps like in a number of countries uh, the main consideration at play uh, is that getting people involved in doing good effectively can serve as um, at a local level can serve as a first step towards them thinking about doing uh, good at a global level um, and so like maybe it's kind of like a hard maybe there are people who would be interested in working on the global problem but like this is kind of like a big uh, piece for them to like uh, bite at at once, uh, but once they start thinking more in terms of effectiveness and like how can how can they 
like do more good with a given uni unit of resource uh, and get as exposed about the ideas about EA, then maybe uh, they become more open towards uh, working and donating to global causes. So like um, having this as a kind of like an entry point, a way, a way for people to like start engaging with this, these uh, opportunities and then at a second stage, if they're interested, uh, going to the global uh, work on the global problem can also be a potentially promising pathway. Mm -hmm. I've definitely seen that happen. People uh, joining the Polish EA mm -hmm. Foundation, having done some previous work in the local uh, context, mm -hmm. and then uh, still running these projects for uh, time, but also um, expanding their knowledge on mm -hmm. how uh, to do it effectively, how to also move into the global problems. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely, well, very powerful, I think, for building career capital as well, if you agree. Mm -hmm. um, also, for building network, uh, not only network of individuals to individuals, but also network of organizations to organizations. I think this local level of research plays nicely into what I would like to see more happening, which is um, for approaches such as evidence-based policy, evidence-based medicine, for them to become more um, available, more uh, widely pursued. Also, I think um, improving institutional decision-making is very much, um, very often done, first at the local level and then scaled up. So uh, these I would see as uh, also very powerful and direct benefits, um, but they come at certain risks, right? Mm -hmm. So what's, what's, your, what's your take on that? Yeah, so I guess like here we've mentioned some of the benefits um, that doing uh, local priorities research can have. Uh, I think it's also important to have in mind uh, the costs that such interventions can have. Uh, and I think one of them, uh, one of the main ones is this risk of value drift. So uh, I guess like jumping too quickly to like trying to help the local level uh, can create a community of people that's mostly interested in doing that uh, and by doing that, we're kind of like missing out on the opportunity uh, to get people involved in the, the global problem. So if all the, the local group is, uh, is discussing uh, is local level problems, um, then we're potentially miss missing out some people who could have, yeah, high, really high impact at a global scale. Uh, and this is something that, yeah, can kind of like drift over time. So you start like with, uh, say half of the community interested in doing this but then gra gradually more and more people get interested in this and like not so many are interested in the global problem and at the end like you end up with a community of people who are mostly interested in solving uh, local problems as effectively as possible uh, which can be like a pretty big cost in terms of uh, helping the world as much as possible. Um, there is also uh, the opportunity cost of like the time spent like doing this kind of research, like identifying the what are the best uh, problems at the local level, and like for the global um, scale problems, we already have like at at least a lot more uh, effort, a lot more research done on how to do these things. So we don't have to like pay this cost, and so. If you want to identify what the best local opportunities are, you kind of have to like do that kind of from scratch, depending on uh, where you are and how much uh, previous work has been done. And this can be very time consuming and, it, and can come at a big cost uh, in terms of your ability to yeah reach out to people who would be willing to work on yes, global what's, problems. What's important is that there are um, some organizations doing this local evaluation, local research, but they usually uh, frame the questions differently in terms of uh, answering to the questions of academia or the government. So not necessarily questions of individuals who want to uh, make a career change or uh, who want to make a career strategy. Um, and even then, um, this research from these groups comes at a pretty, pretty high cost, as you mentioned. I've had an opportunity recently to talk with one of the researchers for one of the academic groups doing public policy uh, research. Um, pretty respectable group with a dozen or more people working on the subject with university backing. And even then, they only evaluated, selected few fields um, of the public policy. So this kind of gives you an idea um, that this can be a very big operation, rather big operation to um, to launch. Um, so this is one risk of mm -hmm. the research time cost and, and um, opportunity cost. Also, 
there is this risk of low quality of the research, especially if it's public facing. I've seen um, this story happening actually this year when one of the researchers published an article in nationwide newspaper, article criticizing one of the big charities in Poland on a fairly shaky grounds. And what happened is that he got a response from the charity itself who um, responded to him in writing in the same magazine and um, to me and also to other readers or commenters, the response was pretty devastating and he, um, he was shown to be quite in the wrong on, on many points. So um, these things happen and this reputational damage can, uh, can happen. Um, so this is a risk uh, mm -hmm. with, 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 we have to be humble, I think, mm -hmm. with uh, starting this sort of a think tank research operations and such. Mm -hmm. Mm, so I think we can go to the case studies now. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah. the first example that I wanted to use here uh, is the one from um, Give Directly. I think most of you should be like should have uh, heard of this name before. So Give Directly is this organization um, working primarily with uh, cash transfers uh, to people living in extreme poverty. Um, they, I th yeah, before 2019, they were like only operating with um, poor countries in Africa. Uh, but recently, I think as of 2019 or 2020, I don't remember exactly, they started uh, also allowing for like people to use their platform to make donations to people uh, in poverty in the US. Um, and this program, uh, the, the US uh, tran cash transfer program, received a lot of attention. They managed to get like a lot of donations, uh, so much so that um, in 2020, they were able to help 10 times more families uh, relative to 2019. And a really substantial fraction of these were families uh, in uh, in extreme poverty, not in the US, but like abroad. So they managed to also get a lot more, like together with all the media attention that they managed to get, they managed to channel like a lot of the donations to the international cause. Um, not only that, but it was also the case that they, so they kept track of like donations uh, for uh, people who first donated to people in poverty in the US. Uh, and they saw that those donors, uh, like, as, a substantial fraction of uh, donors um, subsequently also donated to the international uh, program. So this gives support about the idea that we were discussing before that um, having like this opportunity to engage with the local cause can serve as a first step for people to like become more aware and more interested uh, in donating uh, at uh, a global level. Um, and I think like two important, to, two really key aspects of this uh, successful move, in my opinion, from Give Directly, were that uh, before they started doing this uh, U.S. Um, yeah, U.S. Uh, poverty uh, expansion, uh, they had already set up the international. Um, helping people in extreme poverty program. They, it was already pretty consolidated. It could ab absorb a lot of money. And so like this move uh, made it so that when they got interest for the, the local level program, they could like channel and like uh, direct people who were interested in like helping more uh, to try to support this international program. Uh, not only did, did they have this infrastructure ready, but they were also, um, actively trying to promote the international donations. So when they, managed, when they got like media coverage, they always tried to mention uh, the international program and say that like they thought that, yeah, people in other countries were even needier than the uh, poor people in the US. Um, and uh, in their website, they never like deprioritized the, the uh, international uh, cash transfers. And so like, yeah, these aspects like, uh, I think were quite key for how successful they were in like expanding how many resources they could direct to in the international cause. Mm -hmm. uh, one comment I have to make um, before we move forward is that um, with the previous example of the said researcher, um, 
having an article in a national newspaper. It was a non-EA researcher. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had a better track record of um, doing research, communicating it so far. Uh, especially um, one case study I'm really proud of is the EA Poland and how it got together in the first days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine to um, produce recommendations on uh, effective NGOs, effective charities, uh, helping that very cause of um, humanitarian response to, um, to the invasion. Um, I think with that one we have managed to sidestep many risks because it was a rather uh, concentrated burst of research activity. So um, without sacrificing very much of an opportunity cost there, um, what was also important, we've managed to leverage a local situation that we are much in a very much better position to understand the local um, charities than um, people from abroad, for example. And we could also leverage the fact that we had some communications with the press ongoing, for example, with um, The Atlantic, who uh, did show um, the recommendations. Um, so um, I think this one, we've managed to navigate the landscape uh, fairly well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. what's with the third case study? Cool. So, um, yeah, another, a third example that I think is worth mentioning here is that of uh, this organization called Riesgos Catastroficos Globalis. Um, so this is an EA organization uh, focused in finding opportunities to make mitigating catastrophic risks um, across, like, Spanish-speaking countries. Um, and one example of a project that they've uh, recently written a report about is food production in Argentina following a catastrophe that blocks sunlight. Um, there are like a number of things that I like about the approach that they took and I think it's worth uh, highlighting three here. So I think like the first is that they're trying to work on a global problem. Uh, and so like this is a scope that's larger than like for each individual country that they're working on and so like yeah I think this yeah generally tends to uh, create benefits that um, um, can help the world a lot. Um, I also like the fact that they broadened the geographical scope of the interventions that they're considering and so like they're not acting on like one specific country uh, so they're not like focused specifically on Mexico but they they've decided to uh, try to find opportunities across Spanish-speaking countries, and this naturally opens up uh, more opportunities, more possibilities for high-impact things that um, could be discovered. Um, and the third, uh, and I think also a really key step here, is that they're trying to focus, trying to identify what are the comparative advantages that the like specific countries have in the global scheme of like yeah trying to reduce catastrophic risks so they're not trying to they're, they're not taking the approach of saying like okay so ai is i think is like the most important problem ever so let's try to find out how exactly every country can like do the most to, to improve on AI. They're trying to do the, yeah, I think the, the Argentina example um, here uh, is a good one to illustrate this fact that they were looking for opportunities that, uh, yeah, Argentina seemed particularly well suited for food production in these contexts. Uh, and so let's explore how we can do this the best and with different regions. Um, different regions will tend to like have comparative advantage, advantages in different problems and we can do more good by um, trying to identify what those are uh, and focusing on uh, yeah improving them. Mm, okay so let's go for the takeaways. Um, so one of my favorite one and one I would start with is that well be explicit about your goals everything we've said their cons the pros um, I think they have to be weighed um, accordingly um, whether you want to start to move on with a uh, local research project, for example. Um, so be explicit about the goals, about the benefits you're hoping to achieve as well. Um, what's on your mind in mm -hmm. that context? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think like a few takeaways that are worth having in mind here is that first, I think like doing this kind of uh, adaptation to the local level um, can be really valuable so I think like groups in general should be uh, 
spending a fair bit of uh, effort into like trying to think how to best to do the most good given the context that they're facing. Um, and which includes doing things like the like the the small exercise that I did at the start of like seeing how the country ranks in like income distribution, but also like getting an overall like lens landscape of the country, trying to identify what the best opportunities are. Uh, I think a, a lot of there is a lot of valuable research here to be done that's not necessarily tied to trying to identify what are the best opportunities at the local level. So, for example, you could try to think about um, for example, economically, which sectors is this uh, country most relevant on? Uh, or, for example, are there EA organizations that already work in this country? Or, like, are there any particular issues within, like, EA that are uh, particularly salient in, like, what I've heard about this country so far? Or, like, after um, doing a bit of uh, search in that area. Uh, or, for example, how does this country integrate with uh, other countries in the region? How's like mobility? So, for example, Poland is uh, a country that, um, yeah, is a part of the European Union. So this opens up uh, a bunch of possibilities that countries which are not part of the EU uh, would have. And it also has like, yeah, regional uh, relationships with CE countries, which could potentially be explored. And, for example, yeah, having these like. Uh, multi-country uh, initiatives, which is also something that yeah can lead us to to identify better opportunities. Yes, and I will highlight that. Well, low-hanging fruit still can be there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I think that yeah. So um, the extent to which doing research targeted or or like identifying opportunities um, targeted at helping the country the most is worthwhile will depend a lot on uh, the specific country, but I think like two uh, potentially important things here is like the like conditions that the country is at. So for example, as I uh, mentioned earlier, like if you're in a country like India, uh, who's like a lower uh, middle income country, so relatively low income, at least when compared to most countries here in Europe, uh, and also with a very large population, then this is a context that makes it very likely that there are really good opportunities to help at the local level if we're thinking, yeah, from an impartial perspective. Uh, and so I think in India, it makes a lot of sense for people to try to find the best opportunities to, to, to work at the problem uh, locally. Uh, and on the, on the other hand, in a country like the US, I think this, uh, doesn't make sense, like at least uh, at first, as something that, uh, for people to do. Uh, and then it's, yeah, it's a thing about like, where do we draw the line? This is uh, something that's still kind of unclear, but uh, at the start, like my take is that, um, yeah, there will be some countries like that for which like doing this local level, like trying to improve the uh, region as much as possible from the start uh, makes sense. But even for other countries, I think it's more of a, a matter of like uh, a developmental thing. So like as the EA community develops and we're able to like take care of like people interested in working in global problems, uh, which might be like the people who uh, will end up doing the most good at the, the, uh, that country then moving on to people who are not as interested in working on global problems uh, and focusing on trying to identify what the best opportunities at the local level are um, can lead us to um, have more impact. Mm, yes, uh, I think late stage groups are in a better situation to um, deploy these sort of Mm -hmm. arrangements. Um, I think it's always worthwhile to remember the general mm -hmm. um, EA body of uh, knowledge, let's say, the framework for um, impact, tractability, neg mm -hmm. neglectedness, evaluating that as well, mm -hmm. and also keeping the usual research hygiene of um, asking for feedback, sharing feedback, um, doing the research um, up to the standard, uh, being careful about how you communicate it, uh, especially in outside contexts. and. Uh, one more I would add is that this landscape is shifting all the time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so the local opportunities, even if they're not there today, they might come up um, mm -hmm. at some later date, for example, due to AI um, moving in and changing the landscape mm -hmm. uh, considerably. It also ties into what I um, liked from one of the comments on the EA forum that these local opportunities are not always exactly there to be um, taken. They are 
to an extent also created by ourselves. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I very much like that comment. Mm -hmm. What do you think yeah. on that? Yeah, I agree. I think like, so one thing which I forgot to, to add to um, this discussion here is just uh, the notion that like this is very much uh, an op like how much to do this kind of stuff is very much an open question. I think there is like a lot of things for us to figure out. Um, and yeah, thinking about this carefully, I think is something that can help. But ultimately, yeah, there is a lot of exploration to be done, and I expect us to learn much more about um, yeah, this things, these things as we as we actually go about doing this kind of local. Like, yes, uh, there is a lot of learning by doing. Yes, to I, be I would stick to the here. to the frame of mind that mm -hmm. Carolina Sark had in the introductory address that we're not here to tell you what to think. It's up to up to you to. Uh, mm -hmm take the torch and pass it on, I guess. Yeah, so, exactly. um, and to ask us questions, because now we can uh, jump to q and I think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. cool. if you have any questions, please um, have the microphone from me, and uh, we can pass it on. Oh, sorry, uh, before the clapping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've also prepared some additional materials, some um, things, some uh, research pieces we've referenced to through this presentation. Uh, you can access it at the tiny URL over here. Um, have a look at it on a later date. So I hope this this also becomes useful. Now, uh, please, the round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> and questions. Oh. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it resonates with me a lot because I'm also from Brazil originally and I do community building in Romania now and uh, there's always this constant perception that yeah but what do we do locally it's a common sentiment mm -hmm. and uh, I thought of a, the argument that one of the arguments that I think of uh, that wasn't present here and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about it is that uh, it just seems to me uh, it's kind of it, it's a natural that this happens I think and I don't know to what extent we should fight against uh, certain things. I mean, it is important for sure to some degree, but I mean, I would use the example, uh, for example, there's this, this book, Moral Tribes. Uh, mm -hmm. Joshua Green argues that mm -hmm. at some point, uh, if, the, uh, if the implications of applying a consequentialist moral system seem to be dystopian, like, uh, and this is in the context of people, for example, arguing that ah, one of the implications of utilitarianism is that you, should uh, you shouldn't really care more about your children and family. Mm -hmm. And in EA, I see there's a lot of sympathy for that. Most people say, "Now, of course, this is normal. We care. We will spend more resources on children and family." And yeah, of course, we, it's not really a, a, a big, uh, big controversy. Um, and the, the reason would be that, okay, if we imagine a world where people would really not consider their f uh, f family and children more, mm -hmm. then uh, things it would just become impossible to live up to this standard, or people wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't be able to, or would rebel. Again. It would look dystopian even if we managed to live like that. And also, uh, Peter Singer also makes this argument uh, that uh, in the life you can save, like how much should we demand that people donate? And if we ask them to donate too much, we risk turning them off and uh, yeah, scaring them away from the movement. So this idea that uh, having a different standard of in different countries, I don't see it as necessarily the value drift. You know, like even if you have uh, if you have a standard of how much you help locally because you see poverty around you and it affects your mm -hmm. own uh, psychology, you know, it affects your sense of guilt towards local problems. And if there is a, a distribution in the sense of uh, in some countries we have a tolerance for certain levels of local bias, mm -hmm. I would find it's natural and normal. Mm -hmm. And somehow because the movement started in the West and in rich countries, I, I often feel that this is disregarded, like the, it's expected that, well, yeah, they are just not EA enough. Like if they were EA enough, they would understand that rationally it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also a, an important point to make. Mm -hmm. uh, is it clear what do you think about it? Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so the thoughts that come to mind here, I guess, is like the first one is something like when drawing this, these conclusions, the frame of mind that uh, we were taking is something like let's try to like adopt the like EA like posture uh, and like which is to say like doing good from an impartial perspective. So we're trying to do like the goal here is thinking about how to do uh, as much good as possible. 
using this framework, uh, which has like impartiality as uh, a, a really key component. Uh, and so this is the, the reasoning stance that uh, we're taking. And then like this is um, your question, if I understand it correctly, is basically like questioning what, like the validity of this impartiality p principle. And I guess like um, there is like, yeah, this is like uh, uh, a kind of like a big discussion. Uh, but I guess like the, the, the discussion here is assuming we accept that, what should we do? Uh, but the other thought that comes to mind is something like, maybe you still want to like value those that are like socially close to you more so for example i don't know i value like my family members more than like random strangers uh but it's a matter of like degree do i value um them to such an extent that i have like basically no regard to people who are uh, elsewhere uh, or not and like how strong are these bonds i guess like if you have uh, the, and this depends on uh, where you live, but like if you like uh, value those that are like socially distant, um, even like a, a relatively like n small fraction, but like a small but non-trivial fraction of how much you value those that are socially close, uh, then opportunities uh, abroad might be so big that uh, you would still want to do that, even if even if there are problems. And then like it would vary from from country to country, from context to context, how much you do that. But you can still uh, try to justify yeah justify the uh, international intervention like this. Mm, I would just make a short comment on that. I'm all in for having. Um, sort of a moral parliament of different um, views in your head, not ignoring the common uh, advice, not ignoring the more common moral views as well. So it's perfectly normal, I think, to value uh, naturally the ones which are close to you. I just think that more often than not, we still have so much, many more opportunities to do good that uh, even when we take care of the ones close to us, we can still do much more good uh, for the world itself. So this w is where the impartiality kicks in, I think. And um, these sort of considerations we've had um, would be of interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, I can pass the mic. Thank you. Uh, when I was listening to your presentation, I thought of one thing that I think I would um, could scale um, many interventions and a local perspective can be especially helpful here. I mean, uh, we all know that uh, randomized controls, uh, controlled trials are considered to be a gold standard for evaluating whether the infant intervention works or not. Mm -hmm. And here's a short example. Uh, in the UK, there are only, uh, by now, 12 RCTs in the area of homelessness, uh, assessing the, the effectiveness of intervention in, uh, in homelessness area. Mm -hmm. In the US, there are mm, nearly 300 uh, RCTs. And of course, the US is known to, to, to adopt um, such, uh, such uh, approach. And uh, I think that very a very beneficial way of um, uh, doing this local research would be to create some kind of uh, Google Translate for translating uh, research and interventions to other parties. Because uh, every country we know, every region has its own context. Mm -hmm. And when I read the report from the US on homelessness, um, I don't really have a framework how to use this knowledge, very abundant knowledge, how to adopt it in, in the European context. So uh, this is my first thought that maybe uh, this some kind of translation framework would be useful. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I thought that maybe uh, what, would you, what would be your take on uh, the, the global burden of disease report as a starting point for uh, um, doing some local research. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, on the first point, um, I don't know if I, like, off the top of my head, if I have, like, any thoughts. Like, it seems like an interesting idea. It's, like, maybe something, like, maybe an initial approach that's uh, worth uh, thinking about. Uh, but this would, like, have to do, like, I guess, like, A, this is, like, 
um, this is a local level intervention. And so like if, if we're thinking, yeah, this, um, this might be one of the things that uh, we want to consider uh, if we're trying to uh, do good on that scale, but then like, uh, yeah, if people want to do so, then they should look about like whether there is the need to do that and how much uh, is this like preventing good uh, policy making from being done. Um, and on the global burden of disease point, uh, yeah, I think this is a good start. I think like, yeah, this uh, can very much be one of the first things that people can look at. Like what are uh, the biggest, like, uh, like the the diseases the problem the problems that affect like health in uh, the world the most which ones are like relatively big problems here or like even evaluating like the difference between like the local level and the um, global level uh, how much of a contrast is there in which specific areas what do these differences uh, say so yeah I, I'm I'm very much in favor of using that as a first approach. thank you. Yes, there's also the question of how much translatable is the research itself between different contexts and different circumstances. Um, so um, this is one comment on that. Um, we're starting on the global reports, definitely go for it. I did so myself in some research, so um, I found these to be valuable. And then, well, going either top down or bottom up, both options are viable. Yeah. So I think we can have maybe one more question, I think. Um, Okay, if, ah, uh, there you made it, just in time. Okay. Uh, thank you both, yeah. I put my questions on Swapcart, but um, I think I'll just read it out, or like it wasn't written down very well. Um, I'll, I'll attempt to read it out. Uh, what I wrote was, um, yeah, do you think that like research is comparative advantage, like linked to doing local priorities research? So for example, like knowing the like local language or something, like clearly outweighs the like higher expected impact of like just looking at the poorest area basically. I think that's like the claim you're you're essentially making, and I like basically have a hard time believing that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry if that doesn't make sense. I'm happy to clarify. Wait, can you can you explain that a bit better? Sorry. Yeah, um, I think the the claim you're making is like um, if you're doing research locally. Mm -hmm. There's like some advantage about you doing it in your local region, mm -hmm. for example, knowing the language or understanding the context. Mm -hmm. And that like has some like additional sort of benefit in the expected output of your research. Um, and my, my point is like, I think the expected benefit of just looking at the lo like globally porous area or the like location in which you expect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like ex ante mm -hmm. uh, that your research will like have the most impact. Mm -hmm. I like think that that second thing is like, like way higher basically than the like local advantage mm -hmm. that you have. Um, okay, so if I understood uh, your point correctly, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, th so the idea that I was trying to like make is like not necessarily that like you will become like, you're, you will be like much more productive at doing like research at the local level, but for example, um, should you um, try to find what charities are like the most effective in your local country. This is something like for many countries, this kind of research uh, doesn't exist or doesn't exist to like a degree of confidence that we'll, we'll, we would be able to point people out to. Uh, so should you do that or should you like continue to try to reach out to people uh, to tell them to donate to give all charities? Um, and an analogous considerations apply to um, uh, career choice as well. Uh, but you can think that, uh, yeah, this is something that people, uh, a question that people might wonder whether they should do and the question, and like the framework, like the kind of considerations that we, we presented here kind of help guide uh, decision making in that sense. Like when, like how big are the benefits for doing like this uh, local level research and like trying to get people to like, uh, learn about it and like change their donations and start thinking about uh, effectiveness more uh, and yeah how does how does it compare to like just like emphasizing the global one uh, and I think like the answer like is not as simple like yes or no but it will depend a lot on the context here like we have a bunch of theoretical considerations in practice it's like something entirely else but I think it's like not the case that um, it's always true that 
we should focus on the global one. I also think it's not the case that we uh, we should always focus on the local one either. Um, and we should try to understand these better um, to try to yeah figure out what to do. Yeah, thanks. Yes, I was also thinking that this will differ on a case by case basis depending on the personal fit and many other factors. So um, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we can wrap up um, for today. Thank you for coming once again. Luis Mota, thank you. Um, I also am glad you have uh, came to the panel. Thank you, every everyone, so much. And uh, have a happy rest of the conference. Thank you.